Hi guys, welcome back to MMA UK. I'm Jared Miller and it's a pleasure to be joined this afternoon by Cage Warriors lightweight champion, George Hardwick. George, how are we, mate? We are good, we are good. We just started off the week with Monday morning cardio, waiting for MMA training techniques and sparring tonight. Best okay. way to start on Monday. Very busy schedule for you at the minute then. And uh, first off, I wanted to ask your opinion on something after seeing your socials today. What kind of takeaway do you reckon offers the best fight? Um, I think, I think, you know, the kebab is the classic. Kebab mm. is the classic. But probably, probably someone fueled off of Palmo. Someone with borrow hands fueled off of Palmo. That's going to give you the best. It's just, uh, I didn't want to go on a night out unprepared. So I wanted a bit of advice on that as well. And uh, now, obviously, the main reason we're having you on today is to look forward to your upcoming second title defence at Cage Warriors 152 in Manchester. Um, how's preparations going for the fight and how much are you looking forward to it? Preparations going brilliantly. So we two weeks of training left and then fight week. So we finished the third week of training. Normally, the third week of training out is the hardest in terms of volume and intensity. They're still hard these two weeks out, but we kind of dropped towards the fight length. Whereas last week it was more rounds and rounds and rounds and rounds. But it is, it is all ahead of schedule, speed, fitness, weight. Everything's been ahead of schedule. It's, I think it's just the the experience of these five round fight camps has just made everything go that bit smoother than normal. You fingers, just, you know, fingers crossed. That's not like Sod's Law say that yeah. then anything goes wrong. But it's all been very smooth. Good. And you, you just mentioned five five round fight camps there. It's obviously your third time fighting a five round fight. How do you uh, see the difference in training for those championship rounds compared to the three rounders before? It's, you know, it's a big difference in terms of the rounds, in terms of how you set yourself up before the camp, because it's three five round fighters fights here. But I had another five round fight camp that went all the way through. But then it pulled on the day when Mehdi Ben Lakhdar got COVID, unfortunately. And that was like way back in, not December just gone, but December before. So it's more experience in pacing that five-round fight camp because it can be very easy to go add more and more and more and more and more. But you don't necessarily get more. You can kind of break yourself down too early or not really peak at the right time. And in, term, in terms of it, it's just getting those extra rounds in. But it's also the very, very fight-specific thing that we have towards the end of camp is we, we, it's like position and pads where you're just escaping bad positions or you're grappling minute and a half really hard, then you pads. Minute and a half really hard, then you pads. It's the difference between doing that for 15 minutes or half an hour. And that's the main difference mentally. A, a plus side of the five round fight camp store is because you're training for five rounds and everything's geared towards five rounds, is you burn some extra calories. So you've got a bit of extra leeway to have a bit of palmol. Yeah. And, um, Obviously, for people who don't know, you're taking on Jan Dias in your next fight. How do you see him as an opponent? Because he's quite unknown to the Cage Warriors scene. He's unknown, but he's dangerous. I'd say he's more dangerous than my past few opponents. Even even Kyle Driscoll, who had an amazing record. He was on an eight-fight win streak and he won on the Contender Series. I would say he's more dangerous than Kyle Driscoll. It's hard to gauge them as a fighter overall because we've had different competition, you know, Europe versus America. Hard to gauge that, but I would say this is the most dangerous opponent of fought in Cage Warriors. He can cover distance quick. He's got a lot of finishes on his resume. He has a decent gas tank. He has a good left hand, a good jumping knee. He's got submissions on his record. So I'd say he's the most dangerous, and it's diffusing that is the main goal. Yeah, and talking of the form coming into it, you're on a seven-fight winning streak. He's on a five-fight winning streak. Your streak in particular, how much confidence can you gain from the fact that you're coming into this fight in, in such good form? It's just the rhythm of it, and it's because I've been active as well. It's not just seven fights, but strung across eight years. They've been busy. There's been three fight years, this, that, and the other. I've taken fights which some people would say make no sense. Why are you taking that fight? But because I've stayed busy, I'm reaping the rewards of them. You know, like last year when I was supposed to be fighting the title against Daniel Belwardo, was ex-UFC. He dropped out two weeks before, and then I fought Lucas Capera. Lucas Capera. People would say, why would you take that fight at a catchweight? Just wait for the title fight. But I'm reaping the rewards off of that fight because I've got the experience. I've been in the right rhythm. Some people would say, why would you fight Chris Bungard on four weeks' notice to defend your belt? Why would you put your belt on the line on four weeks' notice? That makes no sense. But because I've fought him, I've stayed active, I'm reaping the rewards of that. And it's all just carrying forward into another title defense. 
Yeah. And you've been labelled by many in the MMA community as the body shot king, especially after your last like three or four fights. In fact, YouTuber, MMA guru, I know he's a controversial figure to some, but uh, described you as having laxatives for hands. Uh, do you, you know, is that description, do you agree with that? Does that, do you think that represents your expertise? So yeah, the body shots are getting it done, but I never go in the fight and think I'm going to body shot. Mm. They're just, they're just there. Maybe it's these small gloves. Maybe it's once you hit them to the head, it's just open. Maybe it's just my style, but they're just, they just seem to occur, especially second, third, fourth round. People are breathing heavy. The thing is, if someone's tired and you hit them in the head, it's kind of the same effect whether it's the first or the fourth round. If someone's tired and you hit them in the body, the more they're breathing hard, the more that body shot has effect. Yeah, and um, so we just mentioned your body shots are a, are a big part of your game, even if you're meaning to use them before or not as you look into the fight. Um, in terms of Lias, his rear naked choke is obviously a big factor in a lot of his fights. Uh, you know, five of his nine wins have come in that fashion. Now, I'm not calling either of you one-dimensional in the slightest at all, but do you think uh, your body shots and his rear naked choke, because of the amount of time that's been effective for the pair of you, do you think that might be something that you look at in his game and he looks at your game in particular? 100%. You see a record with a lot of rear naked chokes in it. You're like, OK, I'm defending the back. I'm getting a lot of rounds in the worst positions possible defending the back. That's how it works. So he'll have seen my record and he'll think, OK, I'm going to get a lot of striking drills where I'm going to bring my elbow in tight and defend the body shot. And, you know, it's like Kyle Driscoll had a lot of good body shot defense in the first round. But I had different ways to use that body shot to set up the head. And I used the head to set up the body. Yeah, it's, yeah. And it's, it's, it's not like a signature move versus signature move thing. Yeah, no, not at all. Not in the slightest. Um, and in terms, I know a lot of fighters don't like giving predictions, but how do you see the fight going in your head? I see third or fourth round finish. I want to, I was really glad to get the fourth round finish in the original title fight against Kyle Driscoll because I wanted to see the championship rounds, get that experience. Now defending it, I want these finishes within three rounds because it's in, the intention is to move on to the UFC after, not looking past the assy, but I want to be able to know myself I can get the finishes within three rounds. You know, last time I got the second round finish, I want to be able to get that finish within three rounds because then that carries over to when I step in the UFC and it'd be three round fights again. But perfect, more cage time, more cage time is always good. And perfectly timed, as you mentioned, the UFC. I was going to ask a lot of the cage warriors, people I speak to, and the company speaks to. The thing on all of their lips is UFC, UFC. But none of them are really in the position you're in. In such a strong position, is the UFC? I know you don't want to look past Lias. But is the UFC at the forefront of your mind should you win this next fight? Yeah. So the moment the moment the win happens, that's when it exists. Currently, it doesn't. It doesn't. It's just this fight with Lias. But even then, people work all this time to get to a main event slot. It's, it's not bad to get more fights in that main event slot, in that title fight slot, and getting that experience and that pressure before moving to you know, prelim fights. So I've got no no mad rush. I'm just happy what I'm doing in life. Improving constantly, defending the belt, coaching, and just spamming out short form content. Yeah. And um, as you just mentioned, you know, how you're improving your game. as You're still 26 years old as time goes on. If you were to get the UFC call today, do you think... Do you back your ability enough in that sense? Do you think you're good enough right now for the UFC? 100%. Me and Harry. You know, Harry as well, because I think the Cage Warriors featherweight division, unless you're top 15 in the UFC, you're not as good as the Cage Warriors featherweight division, the people in that division. Harry, and obviously Vichenik and Hughes are incredibly skilled fighters. The, the top ranks of the Cage Warriors featherweight division is better than what you'd see. UFC featherweight level in a prelim or any, whatever like that. Yeah, and um, talking of other promotions as well, you were formerly in, in Bellator as well as a for one or two fights. How did you find that experience um, compared to what else you fought in? Bellator was good. Bellator was good. Um, there were two strange circumstances. So first was a late notice fight in Dublin, and it was one of the, the easiest fights of my life, respectfully to say, because there was no weight cut, and it was a three-week camp. 
And then in the fight, I just, I just grappled purely. So it was like having a grappling match yeah. and just getting paid for that and getting a free trip to Dublin for that, which I was happy about. The second trip was an interesting one because that was during the lockdown. And it was a week quarantine in this hotel, kind of like a fancy, fancy prison for a week before fighting in this empty stadium. And the fight was good, but that was more of a, a mental test. Everything that could have been testing about is being in this weird isolation, weird hotel for a week, just being stuck with your own thoughts. My brother fought earlier. He lost a close decision. Everything that could have been testing about that experience was, and it just went smoothly. Mm-hmm. So I learned a lot about that. Yeah. And um, you fight out of Middlesbrough Fight Academy for people that don't know. Uh, as you've mentioned, your brother Harry as well, but I know you've got a great relationship with your coaches like Abdul Mohammed as well. How do you um, see the atmosphere in the gym on a daily basis and, and what's the coaching like from your point of view? It's a, Well, it's been a secret weapon my full career to have Abdul as my first day one coach because when I started learning, I was like 15 or 16. And at that point, even the wrestling in UK MMA wasn't as good. But that was my day one coach was Abdul, the slam man, who won the Cage Rage, Cage Warriors belt years ago by wrestling people by outstanding wrestling. So when I fought for the title against Kyle Driscoll, he kept making so much about how he'd been wrestling since he's four. Uh, UK wrestlers aren't on the level of American wrestlers. But because I've been training with Abdul since day one, he couldn't touch me with a takedown. Defended every single one of his takedowns. And it's been a secret weapon since day one. And currently, the gym is just going from strength to strength. It's, it's bouncing. There's loads of energy, loads of guys coming in got this really strong amateur team coming that are better than a lot of pros. Absolutely tremendous things going on at uh, Middle Fight Academy at the minute. And I know you do a bit of coaching yourself. I've seen on your socials there as well. Could you talk to us a bit more about uh, what that's like for you and um, how rewarding do you find that experience as well? I love coaching. I love coaching, especially when people learn it. Sometimes it's frustrating if uh, it's not sinking in, but uh, it's all a really good puzzle. And what you find when you teach things yourself is you make the mental maps between these techniques even stronger and you make realizations about techniques when you teach people them. And then it embeds it more into you. You can change up little aspects of your game because you're like, I've been been doing it this way, but actually when I teach, it's easier to show them this way. And it's all just reinforcing mental mind maps, mental mind maps. It's almost turning it like mathematical in a way. Uh, I do love coaching. You get a lot from it. Holding pads as well. Say you're holding pads for someone. You can always use that as a bit of practice. I'm going to see what telegraphs they're doing. And you can just read what telegraphs people make. Sometimes it's their elbow pops up. Sometimes it's a little chin lift before the jab. Sometimes, uh, you know, they just get a little bit wider. Their chest broadens out. And you can just make a, a mental note of all these telegraphs. And it gets easier to recognize them when you're sparring with someone or fighting with someone. It's hard to explain. That's really interesting because I've heard um, that from other fighters where people like Tim Wilde in Bellator, who do a bit of coaching as well, have said that exact same thing where training people in their gym, do, doing coaching actually improves their game in, in turn as well. Is And that's what you find as well, I'm guessing. Yeah, and I, I just love doing it. I love seeing people improve their technique. It's It's a very satisfying process. Yeah. And talking of like the MMA scene in the UK, you're obviously a big part of the recent resurgence that we're seeing in promotions like uh, the UFC, for example. Um, How do you see the talent kind of range in the UK at the minute? And do you think that we are starting to be compared to those other big nations and those other big continents that are into the sport of mixed martial arts? Yeah. And it's not just that the the UK scene is exploding. We've got massive names from the UK that aren't traveling and doing doing the thing that was the in thing about five, 10 years ago. Everyone's like, you've got to go to a super gym or you're just not going to compete. No one had that confidence. But I think there's been there's been a UK Roger Bannister moment in MMA with Leon Edwards winning the title, training at UK the whole time with Team Renegade being his team. And we're also seeing with Arnold Allen. He's on a 10-fight win streak. He's about to beat Max Holloway. Uh, UK based. It's not. I have to go to a mega gym here and there. I know he's gone to, he's gone training at TriStar, but it's not like completely abandoning ship. No one's 
gone over and thought, I have to do all of my training at the mega gyms. If they're shown that MMA wrestling is different, all these skills are different, and with a good team, it, it doesn't have to be this thing where you abandon them and then you go off to a mega gym. You think you need to be on the mats with all these guys when really if you've got a good team from day one, they can build you the skills. Yeah, 100%. And you mentioned uh, the English fighters in the UFC at, at the minute. How, who do you think the next title holder from England or, or Britain, I should say, might be? Obviously, you've got Arnold Allen, as you say, people like Mohamed Mikhaev as well. Who, who are you looking at at the minute? I don't, I'd probably say Arnold Allen. I think Arnold Allen's going to beat Holloway. I think he's just got... You know, Holloway's respectfully slowed down a little bit. He, he's one of my favourite fighters ever, but respectfully, I think he's slowed down a bit. You know, he could prove us wrong. I think Arnold Allen over those five rounds is just going to maintain his speed better. In the in that opposite stance, it's going to be harder for Holloway to open up his combinations. I think that suits the game of Arnold Allen. And then I think he could even give Volkanovski a really, really hard fight. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And uh, as you said, you just mentioned there, Max Holloway, even though you don't think he'll get the win, is one of your most is one of your favorite fighters ever um, in MMA. Who do you enjoy watching the most at the minute in, in, across all promotions? Across all the promotions. So if we're going like weight class, weight class, obviously Brandon Moreno. I love He does all these things. I love left hooks, body shots, Granby rolls. Uh, he hit a tripod sweep in his last fight against Figueredo and just has that really good energy. Bantam weight, all sorts of names. Just generally any flyweight or bantamweight I love. At lightweight... Benil Dariush is a big name. Yeah. For me, I really, really like Benil Dariush. He's just got this honest, grafting energy. And obviously the Sarukians and the Gamrots, but Dariush is just so good. That mix of Cordero, Southpaw striking with this phenomenal jiu-jitsu. He's, he's a really high level for me. You think Dariush deserves the next lightweight title shot? Yeah, and I think he beats Makachev. I think that left low kick gets through. I think the left overhand gets through. And I think he's got enough on the ground where Makachev won't be able to take him down and get a rest. Yeah. I think there's just too many rolls, too many leg lock attacks. It's going to be too tricky for Makachev, I think. Yeah, well, I personally agree as well. And look, you you talk about the UFC a lot. And finally, it's my last question to you. It's what I ask of everybody who comes on the show. What do you see the future looking like for George Hardwick? I see more, ti more title defences and then into the UFC. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm not a very good person at looking into the future. I take everything day by day. I, you know, I'm, I'm, My plans for the day is what am I doing in training? What am I eating? Can I fit a go on the Nintendo Switch in? That's been my, that's my order of priorities and it's worked so far. Mm -hmm. 